I want to start by understanding what is suicide and why do people do what they do? Sure. Deepika, you know, <clears throat> firstly, I'm glad we are having this conversation because as you said, we tend to not talk about suicide or speak about it in hushed tones. There's a lot of stigma and even fear about discussing this topic. And yet we know that this is probably the largest public health crisis we are facing. Maybe the world is facing, certainly India is facing that. And the statistics tell us, you know, that this tragedy happens close to a thousand times a day in our country. So when someone uh, who's prominent uh, dies from suicide, there's obviously an outpouring of confusion and grief and everyone asks this question. But I just want to remind ourselves that um, everyone is a hero to their family and uh, to this to you know people who love them and that we are losing 800 to 1,000 people every day and many of them between the ages of 15 to 25. We know from data that uh, worldwide the, in the age group 15 to 24, suicide is the leading cause of death. And in India, for the ages 15 to 39, Suicide is the leading cause of death, which means suicide is taking away our youngest people, which is, of course, a tragedy on so many levels, a loss of their life, trauma to the family, and a loss of uh, economic manpower and, and you know, for, for our country and our society. And yet, as you said, we are here in a strange situation where despite the fact that it's so common, we see, seem not to understand enough about it. And, you know, any psychiatrist, any mental health professional who's been watching the recent dialogue online on social media or on TV, the coverage of suicide, knows that obviously there's still a lot of misconceptions. Now, when someone dies from suicide, meaning they take their own life, uh, people ask why. And in, you know, this particular, in, in, a, in this recent case, people are asking why. This person seemed to have everything. Why did they die from suicide? And the implication of that question is that there must be some life event that understandably led to a situation where this person felt that life was not worth living. But that's a very simplistic kind of perspective of suicide. And firstly, I want to remind people that think of suicide as the final fatal outcome of an illness. And asking why did this person die from suicide is like asking why did this person die from a heart attack? What led to the heart attack? Of course, the analogy is not exact since the brain and the heart are different organs. But it's similar in that, let's say somebody goes out for a, for a run. And during the course of the run, they happen to have a heart attack and they die. To ask the question why, you know, we're not going to blame immediately saying that the run caused it or the exercise caused it. We will understand that the heart attack was a result of multiple factors that had probably been operating long before this event. The person's cholesterol levels, their smoking, their high, their high blood pressure, their diabetes, their stress. And one fateful day, the heart was stressed enough that because of pre-existing blockages, blood supply couldn't happen and the person has a fatal heart attack. Now, suicide, we have to start thinking of suicide like that. In other words, what are the risk factors that can increase the person's vulnerability to suicide? And we know this, by the way. I must say a couple of things. Firstly, that... Obviously, there's still a lot that we still need to learn about suicide, okay? But having said that, we do know a lot of facts, and these facts need to be out there for the public. And the first thing is to know that it's a complex condition. Secondly, that there are many variables that go into it. And, uh, you know, I can, I can expand on these variables. Broadly, they are uh, variables that are individual, that are internal, so that and variables that, that are social. That's the next question I was going to ask you, which is, <clears throat> is, it, is it specific to events and there is a tendency to say oh um, this, uh, this 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 person's um, uh, business wound up or um, the failure of a movie or um, a bad grades you know after an examination so how relevant are these uh, instances or these specific episodes or events in eventually the person doing what they do? Sure. Now, this is a good question and, and a bit nuanced, okay, because firstly, I want to emphasize that it is rare that you can attribute a direct cause correlation between the life event and the, uh, um, and the death from suicide. 
But we do know that stressful life events are stressful. They provoke emotional anguish. And depending on the vulnerability of the individual, it depends whether or not they're able to cope with the anguish. But first, let's just define what happens at, you know, what is the state of mind of a person who is uh, on the on sort of the edge of suicide? What happens, the state of mind is a person is feeling extreme anguish, extreme pain, emotional pain. They feel despondent, often helpless and hopeless. And there's so much emotional pain. And during that time, often the thought processes are affected. So they're not able to think creative. So it seems like all options are closed. My life is really painful. Whatever it is that I want, I cannot foresee that I'm going to get it. My mind is not working clearly. I cannot even think of alternate possibilities. And I'm in such excruciating anguish and pain. And because of that, I feel alone. And because the, the issues that, that have caused this compounded by creating loneliness and isolation. So in this feeling of anguish and isolation and pain and lack of any alternate uh, possibilities, the mind can't think about it. A person then says, uh, feels that stopping this, ending this, will, however scared I am of dying, will be preferable to the anguish of life. And that's important to remember. It's not like there's a death wish, but more that there is such excruciating pain in their, in their minds, in their lives, that death seems like the only option. Now, the question is, what brought this person to this point? And here, it's almost as if every individual has their own mix of variants. But broadly, you can think of two kinds of suicide. First is the sort of premeditated suicide, where a person has been feeling a certain way, feeling despondent for a long time, usually has a mental illness that has not been diagnosed, either anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, multitude of illnesses. And the person finally gets to a point with this emotional anguish, which nobody else can understand because all too often we don't understand this, results in, 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 in suicide. On the other hand, you have the impulsive kind of suicide, where a person seems reasonably all right. And then some acute crisis happens, some life event happens. And they don't know that they have this vulnerability. that's not been tested per se before. And suddenly this, this confluence Sorry, of... What do, you, what do you mean by reasonably okay? So my question is, are you, does, is it possible to take your own life without having any form of mental illness? <laughs> is, is, well, is, well, is uh, dying by suicide directly related to mental illness? You know, I think what we all have to understand is diagnosis in psychiatry does not have the same uh, real status as a diagnosis in, in medicine. And by that I mean... We have Sorry, I, I, the reason I ask this is because some of the health officials, um, you know, there was there was this uh, sort of comment going around that while the cause of the death is known, an investigation would be done to understand whether the person um, suffered from clinical depression. Right. And my understanding always was that the two are interlinked. You would not do something like that if you weren't suffering from a form of mental illness. Yes, that is the reasoning that... Uh, so there's a debate because if you look at the literature and if you look at literature that comes from the West, they find that at least 90%, if not more, uh, of people who die from suicide had, you know, when we do what is called a psychological autopsy, which is trying to find out the state of mind of this person and their psyche, before and this. so that is possible, a psychological autopsy of, so basically you can, that is something that can be done on a body. Well, you know, keep in mind that it's not as exact as actually talking to a person clinically before the event. But having said that, one can deconstruct the events of what happened, get information from other people, from family members about their behavior, look at any, you know, writings and so on, get a sense of their state of mind. Right, so that's so what, is, what is the kind of what is the kind of information that one can get from the brain itself or from the mind itself? No, a couple of things here. One thing I want to clarify when you ask, you know, the question is: Does everybody or many people or most people who die from suicide have a mental illness or not? Is the first question. Right. Here we must understand that mental illness is itself a, a diagnosis made on a list of symptoms. We don't have a test. Now, when you look at those list of symptoms and study the population in from Western data, from America and, and the West, the, the research shows that 90% or more of people who, who die from suicide do have a mental illness. But if you look at data from Asia, from India, from Asian countries, 
that number falls to 40 to 50 percent, meaning 50 percent of people did not meet criteria of a mental illness. But as you said, the idea that someone would take their own life without a pre-existing issue, I mean, that is sort of the presupposition that that in this situation, we because they, they're such, a, such an act resulted, ergo, we, we, we say that there must be something happening with the mind that caused that. But it is not, in many cases, it's not clinical depression. It could be something like a lifelong inability to handle impulses, to deal with frustrations. That is not a major depressive disorder, but that a person may have trouble controlling their own impulses, managing their own feelings, but they have managed uh, in life until one day something happens or an accumulation of events that breaks through their defenses. They are unable to control that impulse. And that's the key point that 50% of people who die from suicide in India and probably a significant percentage in the US as well die impulsively. Meaning that if somehow we were able to avert that time, that 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes when they were in this frame of mind, which we call acute suicide crisis syndrome, it's just filled with anguish and inability to think clearly. If we manage to save them during that time, either through a helpline or through making sure they don't have access to lethal means and so on, we can actually make an intervention in this, in this uh, uh, cohort of people. And in the first uh, subgroup of people, those who have had long-standing issues, we need to sort of detect depression, anxiety, and mental illness more so that we can treat that. And by treating that illness, we can make a big difference in suicide prevention.